I shall start off today on the last lecture, which is recycling of ceramics. As I have repeatedly stated through my lectures, courses, that preparing a virgin ceramic is a very energy intensive process. In fact, preparing any virgin thing is a very environmentally polluting and an energy intensive process. Uh, like say for every ton of paper that we produce, we have to cut down 17 trees. About 275, uh, 150 kilograms of sulfur are emitted and close to 150,000 tons of carbon dioxide are emitted. So, preparing a virgin thing is very, very energy intensive. In ceramics, let's take the case of glass bottles. All these glass bottles that you use, uh, they were made in a very energy intensive way. Uh, these glass bottles can be recycled because glass is one thing that is never destroyed, never. It remains silica. The only thing that we have to really look at is how to process these glass bottles so that they are recycled. Now, if I look at it in the, when people are scavenging, they will have plastic bottles, metal caps, uh, plastics, along with the glass. So what is done is, basically, is that uh, these are segregated on a conveyor belt by hand. Now, why recycle? It is many garments mandate you have to recycle. And recycling is good for the company because it does not have to waste that much energy in melting the glasses again, all over again, in preparing the glasses. So what is done? The glass, the, all the garbage are collected, then they are put on a conveyor belt where they are manually sorted. Next, now you have the glass bottles. Some will have paper labels, some will have paint labels, some may even have metal caps affixed on them, metal rings around the neck. So what is done is, first is that the glass bottle is first crushed. The type of crushers that you have employed, I have talked of earlier. It can be jaw crushers, it can be any of the crushers that I have talked of. But this, at the end of the day, what we really need in glass recycling is that any inclusion in the glass should be got out. So this crushing requires fineness of somewhere in the range of, I would say, 500 nm. And you know by vibration ball milling, it is possible. At times in this particular material, there may still be inclusions. The inclusions may still be there. So they are further crushed down to somewhere around 
100 nanometers. This is possible in glass simply because glass is very fragile. If you are doing very hard vibratory ball milling or uh, rotary ball milling, getting to these sizes is not very difficult because the glass fractures an impact. So this powder which is 100 nm size may now have very fine particles of metal may have very fine particles of ceramics which came in as an inclusion. Uh, the paint which is there, which was there on the glass that also has been broken apart. The papers which were sticking to the glass, they are also there. So what is done is first this is subjected to a very high magnetic field. Remove free iron particles, remove free iron particles and then this is passed through successive sieves so that to eliminate paper, plastics adhering to, to the powders, these will be larger particles and finally after this successive sieving what happens is you get a ultra fine grain sized glass powder. Now there are certain issues with this glass powder, it is right. For example, there might be powders of colored glass, there might be powders of colored glass, there may be uh, some fine ceramic inclusions and uh, finally these are the two major problems that we face. These ceramic in inclusions can be uh, suspended. and removed from the dust. These can be removed from the dust. As a result, we are left with glass which may be colored. This is not a big issue. Because if you look back at my earlier lectures, I had said, I had done a drawing that a typical absorption spectra of a glass containing Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus, I had drawn in my earlier lecture, would be something like this. This is due to the iron 2 plus absorption this is due to the iron 3 plus absorption. There is a limit to which we can remove iron from glass. So what did I suggest over there? We add other colorants which causes flattening of the glass color and as a result it can be simply a very transparent glass. The advantage of this process is this 
glass, this powders of the colored glass which are obtained by recycling, these can be decolorized by this process and these can be added to the glass batch. It is not that I use this glass entirely. We take virgin glass and during firing of the making of the virgin glass, this recycled glass to the extent of 20 or 30 percent are added, which cuts down the cost of manufacturing this recycled glass in the first stage itself. Now, one may argue that this is also energy intensive because these have to be crushed and then separated by a magnetic field and then sized by filtering through various screens. But the thing is the cost or the energy involved over there is possibly 1 20th of the energy that would have otherwise been required in generating the virgin glass. And in industry today, this recycling of glass is a very, very standard procedure. Uh, if you look at, um, if you Google, again, due to uh, uh, intellectual property rights process. What I did was I cannot open any one of them. I have googled glass recycling process and there are a huge number of videos, huge number to tell you exactly how this recycling is done. I would urge you to really look at these processes because Recycling has become a very important factor in our life. Uh, for example, one of the biggest problems that our power plants have is fly ash. Huge amounts of fly, fly ash are there and uh, there are no takers. The reason is simply this that uh, for example, I will come back to the whole slide later. But what we have over here is about 65 percent silica about 25 percent alumina, there is iron oxide, uh, you have got over here uh, materials like magnesium oxide and varying amounts of carbon, varying amounts of carbon. Uh, so in this fly ash, one of our biggest problems is, is a rich source of silica, very good source of alumina. The biggest problem is it has got varying amounts of carbon. If you look at it, fly ash has been used in the form of bricks, that is cured bricks. Fly ash is used in cement. There are various uses of fly ash that are there and are slowly picking up. Now, in this PowerPoint, which I shall show, this is a work done and this slides courtesy
This was a work done by these two faculty members <coughs> with Nalco as to how <coughs> they could use fly ash, uh, red mud, which is another byproduct of Nalco to make tiles. Uh, these tiles are over here, just to tell you that these were really made. All these tiles were fabricated from fly ash. Let me now go to the PowerPoint and talk of how were these fly ash based tiles made. What were the raw materials? Uh, Nalco fly ash, I have already said, these are the components. There is sodium oxide, a very small amount. There is a potassium oxide. There is some calcium oxide. There is iron oxide, carbon varying amounts, silica and alumina. That was one constituent. And the percentages are given in the colored graphs. What were the relative percentages? To this, they added commercial ball clay, where again the silica was 65%, the alumina was 31%, there is sodium over here, uh, there is iron oxide over here, there is some K2O and all of this. Now ball clay I had covered early on in the semester as to what are ball clays. They are clays which will break up appear as balls and the composition is as given over here. Another material that was added was fire clay. This is again a commercially available material, it is not a synthetic one as this was added which has got silica about 60%. 37 percent, uh, there is some significant amounts of titania over here. This is a thing which really helped and there is some sodium oxide and potassium oxide. Sodium oxide 1 percent, potassium oxide 0.4 percent, titania was significant 1.6 percent and if you remember earlier I had said Titania was a good sintering aid. The other component that was the red mud. The red mud is a byproduct of uh, Nalco when they manufacture it. And the principal component is iron oxide over here. This is not silica anymore. This is iron oxide. You have got over here alumina. Uh, silica is a relatively smaller amount, it will be about 6 percent or so. You have got significant amounts of sodium oxide, calcium oxide, again titanium oxide. And this is the material, the organics that were there in the red mud on ignition. Um, I will skip the microstructures and first take up this thing. You see, what was done, various amounts of fly ash, red mud, china clay, these were added and dextrin is a basically a um, binder, what they added. All these powders were mixed, fly ash, red mud, china clay and then they were pressed in a die at 200 kilometer, uh, kilogram per centimeter square, dried and heated to up to 1200 degrees centigrade. Here I will just point to show you this diagram. FC1A which has 60 percent fly ash, red mud 20 percent and china clay 20 percent. Look at the uh, strengths. You take Johnson floor tiles, 
the bulk density is 2.19. The modulus of rupture is 31 MPa. Johnson wall tiles density 2.04, modulus of rupture 21 MPa. Kajaria floor tiles 2.29 density, modulus of rupture 53. Now here, if you look at it, this sample F1A, which was basically 60% fly ash, 20% red mud, and 19.5% China clay. <coughs> this had a modulus of rupture value of 35.1. FC1B, this was the only difference was this was fired at 1200 degree centigrade and at 1200 degree centigrade the modulus of rupture jumps to 52.6 which is at par with Kajaria. This sample F1A is far better than either Johnson wall tiles or float tiles. Uh, this particular material over here this particular material is sample FC1B. This has been fired at 1200 degree centigrade and the strength is equal to that of the Kajaria float tiles. Whereas these two belong to F1A and F2A and here what was the strength is not as high as this because it has been fired at 1100 degree centigrade, 1150 degree centigrade. But even then, they are as strong as the Johnson float tiles and the wall tiles. Now, we did a lot of things over there. Let me look at the microstructure. You see, I'll, this is the smallest magnification. What we have here, see here, is there is hardly any viscous flow. It is mostly crystalline phases. If I increase the magnification, what I will see is very fine grains growing in. We are keeping the microscope fixed and increasing the magnification. So if I am at 2, I have increased the magnification at the same point and yet I do not see any significant viscous flow. The particles are finer and finer and they are centered. I increase the magnification still more. Sintering has occurred yet there is no viscous flow in the whole thing. I increase the magnifications a lot more. What we get is these grains, they are finer than 200 nanometers, they are very well sintered and most importantly they are non-wettable. And this is the microstructure of this particular tile which has been fired at 1200 degree centigrade. This recycling of fly ash into a sintered product is by overcoming the problems of the variable amounts of carbon was possible because after pressing operations were done to burn off the carbon carefully. The fact that there was a high amount of titanium dioxide helped in uh, having a very good sintered body. This is a work again to repeat brought into the from the research lab to the classroom 
which was done by Dr. S. B. Mujumdar and Professor B. Odhikari of Material Science in association with NALCO as a NALCO project. The work is still undergoing. I won't go into the details, but I'll show you the uh, flip side. They are already glazing the tiles. Though, though a lot more work needs to be done on the surface smoothness, here they have achieved reasonable amount of surface smoothness. But this work has to be continued. So in this way, using fly ash to generate tiles, which are as hard as Kajaria and from an entirely waste product. No virgin material was used unless you call China clay and ball clay a virgin product, which you may. But the largest part was waste product, fly ash and red mud. And this significantly reduces the energy emission of generated during manufacture of tiles. Another area I would like to take up is recycling of refractories. As one knows, refractories is used over a huge range of areas, <clears throat> be it steel making, be it uh, uh, petroleum industry, be it non-ferrous metallurgy industry, refractories are the mainstay. One of the problems that we face with the refractories is that it takes a huge amount of energy to generate the very pure products. Like say, if I am using alumina refractories, presence of silica <coughs> does cause formation, silica, soda, does cause formation of a liquid phase. In silica refractories, presence of a fraction of a percentage of alumina will cause reduction of the refractoriness. So, today as we are talking of cleaner and cleaner metals, we are moving to areas where refractory material itself has to be very pure. And that's a huge cost. So, these refractory materials, after say a furnace has, after a campaign has been over, it makes sense to use the refractories. What has been done so far is this, that these spent so far, Spent refractories have been used as road bed materials, landfill. materials, all of that. Now, A, land filling is becoming very expensive because we do not have lands to fill. Roadbed material, yes, we are building roads, but is this the optimum or the most cost-effective way of handling these spent refractories? And the answer is simply no. It is better to recycle the refractories rather than simply use them as roadbed materials. There are a lot of other 
natural rocks, etc., which can be used as roadbed materials. Today, many countries have mandated that at least 20 to 30 percent of the refractory in any refractory mix has to be recycled refractory. So, what are the issues over here? For example, in a blast furnace, if this is a blast furnace lining, if this is a blast furnace lining, I'll have a huge amount of slag attack over here. I'll have a huge amount of slag attack over here. It can be in a blast furnace, it can be in a torpedo ladle, anywhere in any steel, any steel or ferrous or non-ferrous operation. Now these pent refractories, are like as in glass, they are crushed to fine powders. They are crushed very heavily into very fine powders. Uh, it can be starts with a jaw crusher and goes down to finer and finer powders. Uh, what are the things that we expect in this refract in this refractory? We will have slag. We will have iron oxides, to name only two. Now, these iron oxides, they can be removed by magnetic separation. So this crushed powder is carried on conveyor belt and subjected to magnetic field. To remove iron oxide. Uh, to give you a rough idea, in a particularly typical case which I am aware of, this is the magnetic field force in a gauss. So, my magnetic field force of up to 12 kilo gauss, we have got hardly 2 percent residual iron in this particular one. So, 
this magnetic field can help us remove the iron to a significant percent. In this particular case, from 20% to 2%. Next major issue is how to separate slag. You see, uh, I had talked of earlier and you know, the color of slag which has got calcium, silica, alumina, iron oxides and a lot of other stuff will be entirely different from the refractory because the com chemical composition is separate. So, if we can, what I would use the term is air classify. I have talked of air classification earlier. If we can air classify, that is basically uh, put the powder on a conveyor belt, that is the conveyor belt is rotating. the slag is following on this and what is happening is there is a CCD camera which is looking at the color. This is a CCD camera which is looking at the color. Depending on the color, there is an air jet which is placed at a strategic distance from this. So what it does is this CCD cameras, they identify the color of the material that is passing through. Depending on if it is principally slag, the material is allowed to fall over here. But if the material is primarily refractory, what happens is the air jet blows it over to a different container. And this is called a basically color sorting device. A device which works excellently and can very efficiently sort out the slag from the refractory. The CCD camera is merely looking at the black or the gray and the white because the slag is gray. And the air jet is used to separate the gray and the white ones. So this is rejected as slag and this is refractory powder. This is the refractory powder. Now here this refractory powder <coughs> obviously this powder has been already ground yet uh, size classification is done. Is needed to blend with virgin refractory. Because suppose the powder size in my virgin refractory composition is this. Virgin refractory. And now, if I add 
these recycled ones, which are somewhere over here, it would be of no use because it would be merely pushing the particle size, mean particle size out here. What is desirable is if this is the particle size distribution of the virgin refractory, the recycled refractory which is added is false somewhere within this cycle so that there is no significant uh, difference between in the particle size of the two refractories, the virgin and the recycled one. And the recycled one can constitute up to 20% of the final product. Today, these materials are being used, that is recycled refractories are being used even in cast tables. These are being used even in cast tables. And the lifetime is not affected much, especially during the first one or two cycles of recycled refractory use in the castables. So essentially, in ceramics, recycling makes sense because of the involvement of high costs and capital investment for making virgin materials. That absolutely makes sense in ceramics. So recycling has to be a definite option that we have to consider. Now, other than recycling, there's a major issue in ceramics, which is which is environmentally benign approach to ceramic synthesis. I have talked in the past about the problems associated with use of uh, non-aqueous solvents. Uh, presence of chlorides. all of which are not only environmental pollutants, but are at times a health hazard. So the question comes, how can we work around this issue of not having to use non-aqueous solvents work mostly in the aqueous media so that the environmental pollution and the personal uh, hygiene or personal health is not compromised. Let me take one case of synthesis of a particular material. Uh, which is um, basically lithium niobate. It's a optoelectronic material used extensively. Now, lithium niobate, how to make it? Because we grow large crystals from this. 
how to make it from aqueous media. Well, the first thing says niobium oxide is very tough to dissolve in water. Is very tough to dissolve in water to give you this will happen only if the pH is above 11. Now, to make this lithium niobate, which is a very strategic crystals or whatever that an environmentally benign approach would be to take Nb2O5 H2O2 mix add um, NH3 pH is above 11 and uh, basically stir clear solution of this particular compound. Now you can add to it lithium salt solution over here, lithium nitrate or whatever and what you get is a white precipitate. Now this white precipitate is really the complex. This can be calcined between 300 degree to 500 degree centigrade giving you lithium niobate. This method of obtaining lithium niobate avoids all other methods which have been used in the literature since this is an entirely environmentally benign process. The temperatures required for calcination are also very, very low. And hence, this particular material, synthesis of this particular material is environmentally benign. Similarly, materials like barium titanate, I have talked of it endlessly, endlessly. This barium titanate, again, what we can do is barium nitrate, uh, dissolve in water, add to uh, titanium mm, complex, the pH has to be controlled. What we get is a precipitate. This when calcined again between 300 degree to 500 degree centigrade gives you barium titanate. Sol gel processing, my colleague Professor Bushu Mayumdar, he prepares uh, materials for lithium ion batteries and everything where the maximum temperature he uses is hardly 300 to 400 degrees centigrade to get thin coatings. Another way to obtain uh, 
thin coatings in a environmentally benign way is to use photo irradiation. Use spin coating material on a substrate, expose it to ultraviolet radiation. The material generates free radicals. They polymerize and you get coating straight away. Today, your cathode, <coughs> sorry, the cathode ray tubes are on their way out, but all these electrochromic coatings are done now by ultraviolet photo irradiation instead of heating them to 600, 700 degrees centigrade. These coatings are heated to 200 degree then ultraviolet irradiation is used to photo irradiate it and you get the required coating. So essentially, in this lecture, what I have talked of fundamentally is about recycling because we have to recycle. Otherwise, the cost of each of those processes were becoming very high. And also adopt uh, benign processes, especially water-based processes, so that we can avoid the uh, non-aqueous solvents, which are not only environmentally unfriendly, but is also, are also frequently carcinogens in many cases. This has been uh, covered over a very wide area I have covered. There are many other things which I wish I could have done, but then the course would become too large. That will the other areas which need to be covered will be taken up separately in a different course. I hope that you have this course series of lectures would have helped you. I have started from historical setup to phase diagrams, different ways of synthesis different ways of fabrication and uh, finally with recycling. In between, I have talked of huge technologies. Now, I had given a list of books to read. Uh, I would say this is a book which I had just come across. This is Processing of Ceramics by Komar Neni and Bertrand Lee, Taylor Francis. This is a good book for studying processing of ceramics. It is not that I recommend the book, but I happened to come across the book and it is a good one which you should look at. I hope you have enjoyed the lectures. Thank you.